I have some announcements just for organizational pur purpose. So for those of you who have to leave today, you have to check out before noon. And um, so we would shorten the coffee break a little bit. So they would serve the coffee break here. So instead of 10.40 to 11.10, it would be just sort of you have 10 minutes to go and then check out. And then we, we start again at um, 11, roughly. Yeah. And um, so for those of you to have who have to leave early, lunch would be served from 12 o'clock onwards. Um, what else? And then at the, the end of the session, so we would like to encourage you also to give the feedback and uh, your opinions about the conference. And those of you who need reimbursement, um, please send all the received and the original boarding pass. It has to be the printed out to um, Katia Shop. I, I believe that you have exchanged email with her as well. So um, please send that to her as soon as you can. Yeah, thank you. Well, good morning. Since this is the time of announcement, I will just say another word on the publication plans. Uh, as was already communicated to you in an email before, and we mentioned briefly uh, in this session, uh, the idea is to consider all the papers that were presented here for a special issue of the Vienna Yearbook of Population Studies, which is an uh, uh, annual publication that has uh, in the meantime received quite high uh, rankings among demographic journals. Uh, they are strictly anonymously refereed uh, the usual way, uh, but the way we do it is that um, I am the, the main editor of the journal and then uh, Bilal Barakat is the executive editor, but then each time we have a special topic. And for this special topic there are two, usually two, uh, topic guest editors. And for this session, uh, the guest editors will be Levin Zhang and, and Raya Mutarak. And um, yes, we hope that many of you will be able uh, to send a paper. Uh, some papers are already existing in draft form, but uh, you may want to revise them uh, before submitting. So the question we have to settle here now is what is uh, an appropriate time horizon for the deadline for submitting the papers? Uh, we are not under tremendous time pressure. This should be the uh, 2015 issue, but production takes about a year. Um, so uh, my experience tells me that as an editor, it's probably the most efficient if we have a deadline very soon, because then you are have, have the idea still, the discussions fresh in your mind and already on the way back, or uh, the first days at work, you, you can revise what you've already done and, and get rid of it and send it to us. That's, probably the most efficient way, but I also realize that this will not be a possible in every case. Some people have other commitments or still more work to be done before the paper can be submitted. So um, what about uh, having sort of a deadline that is uh, four to six weeks from now? Would this uh, seem uh, appropriate or is this too close or do you have any sentiments there? Uh, that w then I would suggest essentially sort of the middle of June, because if we go to the end of June, then there's summer break and some people have other priorities. And uh, uh, would that be acceptable that we say uh, by the middle of June, the 15th of June, and we send you a reminder maybe next week, just to uh, more clearly specify again uh, the, the, the deadline and where it should be sent, and then just remind you once you're back in your daily business at your home institution. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. So we start uh, session eight a bit late. So it's already eight minutes late. Um, and we have uh, the title of the session is Vulnerability and Risk Assessment, uh, Global Level and Comparative Perspective. We have three papers. Uh, the first paper. First time I'm doing this, so <laughs> so we have uh, three papers, and uh, each of the paper have 30 minutes uh, altogether. So uh, about 20 minutes of presentation, and then 10 minutes of discussions, like we had uh, previous in the previous days. So the first, I would like to invite Stefan Kainberger to present the first paper. Thank you.
good morning. So I'm following also Andre's example to be on the stage close to the slides. Um, I am going to present about um, vulnerability assessments and its possible links towards um, future scenarios. So we have done some work on that and also um, coming back on that some opportunities and constraints. So the context of the research, it has been carried out, so I'm showing two case studies and one has been uh, in a very past project uh, called Bramatwin, European project, and this focused also on climate change in Austria but also in on the Brahmaputra. And the recent work we are carrying out is at the moment Healthy Futures, also looking into climate change adaptation towards vector-borne diseases. And from there I'm drawing some examples and I would also like to acknowledge my colleagues who contributed into this different um, work then. So the overview of my presentation, at the beginning I would like to um, provide you some general thoughts um, about vulnerability assessments in general. And then I will specifically look into two case studies. So one um, on in Austria on floods and the second one looking into malaria and vulnerability assessment in East Africa. And there I will draw some um, conclusions out of that. So general thoughts to begin with that. Um, the assessment of vulnerability, so it's also attached and we have seen that also in the beginning um, to different concepts and that makes it somehow difficult also to define these terms because it's involved by different schools of thought coming from social sciences. However, we can also see and Professor Lutz was showing this on the first slide, this famous propeller slide. I think there's a kind of convergence of the concepts taking place now at the moment, especially with the new IPCC framework, which was a big change actually, because uh, vulnerability has been defined in the climate change community much different as it is being proposed now. So there's a kind of a convergence between climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Then there's always the question of representation to find uh, a valid set of indicators, because vulnerability needs a different set of indicators and which are evidence-based so and I think also probably demographers can contribute a lot to that to find this kind of evidence-based um, vulnerability indicators. It's an issue of validation and of course always a data availability. Then there are different methods, quantitative, qualitative or mixed methods approaches linking to statistical procedures but also methods applied in composite indicator development for instance also, also spatial approaches. And there's an issue of communication so to provide this as a final map, so you will see later on some maps, but that's also um, an important issue to consider certain um, kind of conventions. There's a famous book, um, How to Lie with Maps, so you can also manipulate your kind of results um, doing it. But all of these different um, things have some inherent um, uncertainties. So I think this is also uh, important to consider because all these uncertainties in vulnerability may derive from these different um, issues. Actually, the topic of this um, workshop now also has this term differential vulnerability. And what I thought, okay, what kind of differential can that be? And that's a kind of an ordering example or an attempt to order different vulnerability um, assessments in the space. And I think there is one dimension is to ask what. And again, here I think um, what is vulnerable and what, how is it being defined? And again, here I think demography can a lot contribute to this evidence-based information. There's the where, which is important, the location, of course, there is the um, a temporal component attached to that, and I'm also going address later on. The spatial approaches, our traditional approaches, there's an issue because sometimes they often neglect the true spatial um, information because they use so-called a priori geographies which is based on administrative boundaries or neighborhoods or whatever and they are somehow artificial and they do not also include topological relationships. So for instance um, examples would be whoops, um, the Human Development Index uh, we have also have been mentioned that so that's a kind of classical composite indicator also multi-criteria assessment and in our department we thought to go a little bit ahead of that and to develop a concept, and this is where the maps later on come from. Um, it's so-called geons, and what is a geon? It's a kind of a spatial unit that is kind of homogeneous in terms of a varying space-time phenomena. So for instance, like vulnerability. And they build on so-called um, regionalization approaches, and they also attach then later on a certain index to that. So what is the final outcome of that? Um, you know, it could be a whole topic about that. But the issue is to derive homogeneous spatial units, so in kind of regions, let's say, 
which are independent from administrative boundaries. And this homogeneous regions have a kind of, as it said, are homogeneous, so they have a certain kind of um, characteristic. The temporal component, I think it's also important that risk may change over time and you can assess, for instance, the present state, look into the past or having a kind of a certain period we are looking at, or you also look into the future. And I think with the um, future issues, I think most of you are aware also about this process, going from these old stress scenarios to these new RCP based scenarios, also including these, these SSPs. And I think there's a lot of potential now also linking up with the kind of new approach of defining risk in the IPCC context to in include further information on that. And this has been quantified, actually a lot of my colleagues from YASA or CISIN, they were doing that, having population estimations for future based, for instance, on certain stress scenarios. And for the stress scenarios, there was also spatially disaggregated information um, available for that. But why doing a vulnerability, ass vulnerability assessment? And I think there's a clear policy relevance and there's a large demand asking for that. And the central question is to know what to do where and when. So for decision makers, and of course to have the overall aim to reduce risks and later on to reduce the impacts of disasters and diseases and so on. And it's also attached to the identification of place-specific interventions and it needs somehow to communicate a complexity. You know, vulnerability is quite complex in an integrated manner, but also allowing at the same time to look into the um, you know, underlying variables or indicators in a decomposable way. So let's see how uh, we try to achieve that with this example from Austria. So this has been based on the Salzach River Basin, so which is a, a river basin yeah, in Austria. You see it located here. And what we are in Austria, very lucky, because our census data comes uh, also is available on a regular grid cell basis, you know, raster based. And this allows also to explore new methodologies in integrating the data. And as you can see also on these maps, you know, on the right, you see this kind of disaggregated uh, raster based census data, and it gives you much more clear spatial representation than it would have been on kind of an aggregated artificial administrative boundary issue. So this is some results. I'm not going. I'm going later on a little bit into the method how these kind of geons or vulnerability units are being derived. So this is kind of an assess assessment for the present state. It included 52 kind of different variables. This was also based on the let's say very old IPCC definition. But what we are trying to aim with that um, was to go and have um, a little bit of this future view. So let's go into this scenario issue and let's see what is the crystal ball. Is it? Okay. okay, thank you. And um, is it better now? Okay. <laughs> and um, so how did we do this kind of future vulnerability protections and the method? So out of this kind of 52 variables, we were identifying five key variables. And then there was a regression of these five key variable variables with an overall index, which has been calculated to be able to calculate it and project it into the future. And there was then a correlation of past data of these uh, five key variables based on population and GDP data because we then used future proje uh, projections of population and GDP from YASA or CISIN and so on to get also this future data of the key variables and then apply this regression to calculate the future vulnerability index. And this was kind of an explorative um, way we did that, so it's actually not yet published because um, there's some kind of uncertainties always attached to that, maybe we're playing a little bit around. And I also thought to present it here probably to get some feedback. But this kind of, there has been five key variables out of that, and this was the number of houses with one or two households, number of industrial buildings, always per grid cell, number of labors in agriculture, number of academics to represent some of education, and the number of male full-time employees. And there has been this kind of uh, regression or correlation with the GDP and population, and also this overall regression function. And then this information was used to also have the baseline vulnerability, you know, it's similar to the map what I've shown you before, but just based on these five key variables. And then also including this kind of future projections of vulnerability, 
we kind of calculated the change. For instance, like this is the A1 scenario, and the increase in percent red, there's an increase of vulnerability, and blue, there's a decrease of vulnerability. And based also on this kind of key variables, you can see that major urban areas, so for instance, here this is the city or agglomeration area of Salzburg and other, um, let's say, local centers, they have a kind of an increase in vulnerability. And ro rural areas where this kind of labor in agriculture and so on may have a decrease in vulnerability. And this is, for instance, for the B2 scenario, it looks a little bit different because it's not so strong, let's say, as, as the A1 scenario. But this is somehow kind of a uh, disaggregated manner and also in a sense of a quantified information on that. Of course, you can also see the maximum increase and decrease per scenario then where A1 is much more accentuated than going towards the, the P2 scenarios. So that's what we tried and we're um, playing around, let's say a little bit, how <laughs> such kind of disaggregated vulnerability scenarios can be achieved. The second example I would like to show you um, is the current work we are doing in East Africa. It's actually looking at how climate change is going to affect uh, malaria and so on. And you can also see here from the red, um, yeah, the red um, points or pixels is the population distribution in East Africa. And the hatched line is where there's present day malaria available, so like here or here. And then you can see there's large areas like here in Kenya, but also Rwanda, Burundi, which may be impacted by um, changing um, distributions of um, malaria then. So and this is because in the highlands and large populations living there. So there's a kind of uh, population and the endemic malaria is kind of heterogeneously distributed. What we also did is to try to come up with a risk framework, which is somehow, let's say, not new, but it's kind of yeah, integrated also in the um, public health domain, and where you have the environment and societal issues, and then you have the so-called hazard of vector-borne diseases, probably which is mainly driven by climate factors, so temperature, rainfall, land cover, and so on. And you can also calculate certain uh, probabilities. It's available, modelers are doing this. It's the so-called entomological inoculation rate, which gives you a probability of an infective bite. So it's really kind of a probability measure. And in the societal issue, there's the vulnerability being embedded. And we said it's kind of the predisposition of the society to the burden of vector-borne diseases, morbidity and, and mortality and so on. Of course, there's a coupling in between. There is um, an exposure related to both of that, but overall it comes up to the, to the risk. And I think why we are doing that is to identify in an assessment possible intervention options to reduce the risk, to have vulnerability interventions or probability to exposure interventions as well, interventions on the hazard if possible. And this also links of course to the framework which has been proposed by the um, IPCC. I'm not going into much detail on that, but uh, you can uh, have ever-ending discussions about that, but we also had to define how to define vulnerability, because to each of these boxes, you're trying to attach your indicators then later on. So and this is a strong process, of course, which tries to involve different um, experts from the domain. So how did we derive now um, a little bit more about this methodology, this kind of homogeneous integrative spatial units? First, you always try to define this conceptual framework, how to define risk and so on. Then it's the identification of a lot of data, and which is available, and the indicators, of course, but then you go to the data. There's data transformation, imputation of data, outlayer treatment, normalization, multicollinearity analysis, and so on. And then you have a final indicator list, and then we apply this kind of regionalization algorithm, which also includes um, expert-based um, weightings, and we calculated a vulnerability index, which is actually a vector magnitude, so it's a distance in a, in a multidimensional vector space. There's also local sensitivity analysis. In this case, if there's some bad results, you have to go back, but then in the end, um, you try to visualize the results as possible. So these are the different indicators attached to that, and these are also the weightings given by experts. So there was a lot of information or weight given to the use of bad nets, for instance, but then also um, living in epidemic areas because there's an immunity to malaria, people can develop poverty indicator, then also prevalence of stunting children, and there's also the education indicator, which was kind of reflected by the distance to, to schools and so on. So and how to integrate this information? So these are the spatial layers of these different indicators. For instance, a poverty indicator data set. This is the malaria immunity. 
the use of the bad nets in, in Eastern Africa, also conflict indicator we used because there's also an um, issue attached to conflict. And these are again kind of these homogeneous regions of vulnerability for East Africa. So they are independent if from climatic factors. So this is really only the, the societal issue. So it does not show you the real distribution of malaria, but the vulnerability attached to it. And what can you do, or what can you see here? So now the white lines show you the boundaries of administrative units. And this is kind of independent from that. And as you can see, for instance, like in Rwanda, they're very small administrative units. And in Kenya or Tanzania, they would have been large. And we tried to have a kind of a common assessment towards this um, or a kind of yeah, common spatial approach to that. So what can you do with this information now? Of course, you can try to identify so-called um, hotspots. And, but not only that, so if you also uh, want to identify hotspots, you also want to know what you need to do there. So what are the factors contributing to that? So if, for instance, it's also interesting to see this region here. This is Nairobi, actually. So this comes out of the data, not because of administrative boundaries, because of the underlying data. It was really kind of um, delineated as a, a homogeneous unit. And in this sense, you can also get further information. What are the factors contributing to this kind of uh, value? And in this case, you can see, for instance, there's an issue with immunity in um, Nairobi because it's very high altitude. There's no current malaria then after that. So these are the different indicators. So for instance, the protection issue seems to be an issue because people are not so much using yet um, bad nets. But if you look, for instance, in the neighboring region to the, to the west, you can also see just looking at the different colors in the, the pie charts that other factors are contributing to that. So this allows actually the identification of the hotspots, but also allows the identification of what to do where, let's say. So really you can here see if um, measures have to be intervened at this area, then there's, for instance, an education issue, protection measures, but also immunity and so on, or the distance to, to health facilities. So actually the pie charts, just to explain that, show the relative percentage of which is the indicator contributing to, and this is uh, the absolute values of the of the indicator. And there's another region there, it's also just to show you again, you're just looking at the different patterns or the colors or the distributions of the pie chart, so to see that there is um, yeah, different um, indicators are contributing to the vulnerability then in the end. So what are we doing now? So this is kind of work uh, ongoing um, at the moment, also in regard to scenarios. And we're also collaborating because ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute in Nairobi, is partner, and they are embedded in the CGR centers. And they have uh, um, made some localized Eastern African scenarios. And we are now building or trying to integrate on them. But we also, and uh, going back, sorry, because they also did some scenarios on regional integration versus fragmented status or reactive governance, proactive governance, and define some scenarios like industrious ants or herd of zebras and so on. There are some kind of underlying assumptions. I think also colleagues at Yasser, they are also involved in that from the Globium to, to, to model that then. We also tried to link that a little bit to um, the SSPs, how this could be represented by the SSPs later on. But what is available at the moment, it's much more kind of qualitative indicate, uh, qualitative assessment, which has been done in an expert workshop saying, okay, um, what would that mean for specifically vector-borne diseases and saying, yes, investments in education, elevation of poverty and malnutrition would reduce under the industrious end scenario, the reduction of vulnerability of the rural poor and vector-borne diseases and so on, and better disease prevention treatment, early warning systems available. So there have been some assumptions that there would be probably under this kind of scenarios, um, different vulnerability patterns to malaria, for instance. And this has been done for the rest of the four. But of course, now we would like to go towards a more um, quantitative integration. Of course, we know there is this different projections available, also the ASA. Um, for the SSPs and for the different countries. It shows you here the different population projections for Kenya, for instance, or also urbanization data and also the a link to age and education and gender as well. I think probably most of you are aware, so these are the different countries. But also what this can also be shown, of course, in, in a map. For instance, this has been the change of, um, change of female population in person in different age groups and so on. But this can also then be 
of course, mapped. But what we, we would be interested in also having there some kind of um, disaggregated information on that. So what are the opportunities or challenges and conclusions? Um, because this was yesterday a little bit discussed, and as we are in a, let's say, Buddhist country, probably it's also an uh, opportunity to propose kind of the middle path, let's say, in regard to these indi indicators and indices, how we are going to develop. So I think it's not a question either or nor to have an index or not. There's a high demand for that, and it's also kind of somehow policy relevant to have this integrated information communicated, but of course it needs to be combined um, with this underlying and access of the indicator. So this is something um, important then. There are certain uncertainties in the present day vulnerability assessments, also from conceptual approaches, methodologically, and the issue could be that this could be aggravated when including also future scenario data. So this kind of uncertainty span is going um, up then. And also we do not know yet uh, how future vulnerability may be characterized. So, you know, maybe different factors may be, or different weighting of factors in the, in the future may impact vulnerability differently. So, because of general changes in society and so on. But also, and this would be our need, let's say, or our interest to have this kind of uh, spatially disaggregated um, population scenario data under the SSPs, which also, I think that would be important to somehow um, include also socioeconomic driven land use, land cover changes, which also um, somehow reflect urban, rural changes and so on. Okay, so that's it from my side and thank you very much. So, questions? Eleven, Wolfgang, there and there. Uh, Stefan, this is a uh, fascinating. Uh, <laughs> you, you, um, this is a a. We had well, the, um, democracy and differentiated uh, um, um, vulnerability. Then you um, presented an, a very good uh, example. How should we do? And um, as a population, as a group, um, we're talking about uh, the individual um, heterogeneous uh, and also you consider at a group level what uh, can be talk about uh, hom homogeneous, uh, uh, find the, the, the characters uh, uh, has a good representation for um, future vulnerability. And, and you also consider the spatial um, dimension. And my question for you um, is, um, now you, you uh, mostly um, work with the older scenarios, the stress. And what's the time frame for you to adopt uh, the new uh, SSP uh, and, and uh, projections uh, in, in the analysis. Uh, and this is a, a, a couple of uh, um, big research projects. Uh, and uh, uh, what will be your focus uh, if uh, you, know, you want to contribute to, to the special issue? So the, from the project perspective, because this uh, East African um, Analysis um, has to go until the end of this year, so this would be kind of the time frame of the project, let's say. So probably we have to be also pragmatic and live with what is available at the moment. But from our interest, of course, you know, we can also um, integrate this data when it's available also later. But of course, from the project perspective, um, it would be until the end of the year. So we would need this kind of data um, as soon as possible. But I'm um, not sure if this is... Um, yet available already talked to to Samir and to you as well so but I think we can explore already with that what is available so probably we have to leave a little bit our kind of disaggregated let's say ambitious view of having this disaggregated view and work also on the on the country level so and also integrated data what is available I think because it's really good to have already what is available yet so this kind of education gender data so it's really excellent to use that so that's what we can contribute to Well, thank you very much.
Well, maps are a wonderful thing, and, and I love them from early childhood. And you, I really have always to sort of uh, make sure I'm not carried away with it. And the, uh, but uh, when you, we look at the determinant, I think yesterday when we walked along the, the jungle path there, where some of us had a discussion really uh, uh, summarizing it in, in the sentence, what matters more, where you are or who you are, or the combination of both. Now, uh, your concept of this geon really drives it into one very extreme. It only matters where you are. Uh, because you are assuming that then within a given uh, area, geon, everybody is the same, sort of to say, homogeneous. And, and of course, that is not the case. And the question is, how, how small areas do you have to go uh, to make it the case, or can it ever be the case? Um, I mean, you mentioned the example of Nairobi. I mean, Nairobi is, is, has, is the most heterogeneous place you can imagine. They are the wealthiest people of Africa living there in the most wonderful neighborhoods and the wonderful circumstances, and then the slums of Nairobi are probably one of the worst places on this planet where uh, just terrible, uh, not only violence, but also child mortality and all kinds of diseases. But yet, for you, this, they are within one region and you have aggregate indicators for this. And the question is really how, how small, like in Austria, I think this was with five kilometers or one kilometer grid, but even there, I mean, even under the same roof, a newborn baby or a handicapped person is much more vulnerable in many respects than the adult. So where do you stop and, where, and why not explicitly also consider the social heterogeneity, who you are? I think that's a good point. So what is important also to consider is the validity of the assessment now, because this was on the East African level, and this would really inform, let's say, East African policy makers. So zooming in into really a lowest level, I think it's not valid anymore. So you need probably a different indicator set, because you are then going more probably to local scale levels or much more higher resolution data. So this is, let's say, valid for an East African policy domain, like would be like a global assessment, always for a global decision makers and also probably um, on, yeah, on a local level. So it's always different and it can need kind of different assessments. So for Rwanda, actually PhD is doing such an assessment for Rwanda at the national level and on the, on the local level. And it also uses different data. And I think also the second point in regard to the social kind of differentiation, I think yeah, that's also valid and important, let's say. So I would also not neglect that. Uh, of course, we come from a <laughs> spatial approach and try to, to spatialize and, of course, go a little bit further with these geons, let's say, because it can, we can see somehow this kind of differentiation in the region. But, of course, this can also be reflected, let's say, in an indicator framework as, as well, and, you know, which indicators to include and re uh, are valid to represent vulnerability. But in the end, you know, it's one part of making decisions. And if you have identified certain hotspot areas and so on, maybe you in the next step or then you go into much more detailed information, not only spatially, but also in this kind of social differentiation. So I would see it's not, again, not as either or nor, but somehow it, it goes together. Yes. Um, I think, yeah, you can be really wowed and carried away with this. Um, and let me speak a little bit about East Africa. Having done these uh, vulnerability assessments for the last 15 years, particularly trying to address uh, uh, food insecurity, malnutrition, I think this type of, um, uh, these type of uh, spatial models are kind of one layer that we can use, maybe a first or second cut. But if we want to get towards adaptive capacity, and we are trying to move towards adaptive capacity, I would say what we've been focusing on is this uh, infrastructure or institutional capacity, and even institutional, administ administ institutional analytical capacity. Uh, because early warning systems are not good enough. You have to be analytical and you have to be targeted. Now, following on what Wolfgang said, I think what we've been doing to move from what you did uh, when we, we did these hand-drawn maps in the, in the early 90s, is we moved towards away from administrative zones to get at agroecological or what we call livelihood. We overlaid the livelihoods with the agroecological, particularly for malaria and for acute malnutrition the altitude is, of course, very, very important. So that's a second 
layer. And there are, with the World Food Program, they have their vulnerability uh, VAMs, uh, vulnerability assessment mapping units. So you overlaid, you have the administrative, then you have the uh, livelihood zones, and then we began overlaying the anal institutional analytical capacity to collect, analyze, use, and act on the basis of the, of, of, of the data. So I would encourage you to, well, what you're doing is useful. We need to move towards the uh, realizing that even within a district, you have three different agroecological zones. And then, as Wolfgang said, you can cut across that and look at those who have a lot of land and those who don't have a lot of land. So these are kind of layers. But I think uh, what you've layered out what you started is a, good, is a good base layer because you do have data by administrative areas. But for our interests, you do have to begin. We do need to begin adding in the, uh, the institutional analytical capacity within those layers. No, I agree also on that. Um, in the past project, which was called MOVE, and with you and you and other colleagues, we were defining a vulnerability framework, and we had different dimensions. There were six dimensions, social, economic, physical, environmental, and cultural, and one was institutional. So, and of course, you know, you can assess these six dimensions, and this was an approach more towards social economic issues. And of course, if you want to address vulnerability, you may also need to address the institutional dimension, address institutional you have an institutional vulnerability assessment. Probably that's not so easy to make it spatially, let's say. Of course, you can do it for the countries and so on. But I think that's also um, needs to be done. And so a lot of discussion always in this vulnerability assessment with social scientists, let's say. Some say, ah, it's, that's not possible to quantify. Of course, you know, we have a research interest in to see how much we can go. But I would also not see it's either or. So probably a quantitative needs to be accompanied with a qualitative assessment. And which also addresses then probably these institutional domains and also this kind of social differentiation much more. Um, very nice presentation. Um, I have a lot, of, a lot of questions, but I'm just going to focus on some of them. And some of them are more conceptual on the spatial geography part, and others are more on the how exactly, what exactly you are measuring when you are changing so much the spatial base. Uh, one is that, one already mentioned, Charles, you have different regionalization that are going to overlap one after another, and each regionalization has a specific target in place and a specific logic. Uh, and I want to mention this because you said that boundaries are artificial. Boundaries are, in most cases, showing what are the political powers in the place and what is the extension, the territory where those political power has, has injuries. And I think that it's important to keep that in mind that even some of the census boundary could be arbitrary. In other cases, the boundaries are showing division of power and need to be considered, particularly if you want to have a policy uh, 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 application of this. Second is that the qualitative narratives, and this is just a narrative, uh, is not the whole qualitative work, and the qualitative work needs a, a different approach also that means growth through. You have to go to the place, at least some places, or look at some research and build the qualitative. Qualitative is not only narrative, it has a lot more to do with that, and social sciences could be very quantitative, uh, so that's just some of the, of the issues. And the other is, um, more specifically, how you address these geons especially over time. Are you assuming that there are not variation in this expansion over time? There is no changes in this? Because these are basically grids. So how you, how you address that? Are you assuming that they are invariant or they are, they are assuming some kind of uh, expansion in one axis or another according to the trend that you are identifying? Because that could be such nice to have. <laughs> Thank you. Shortly, we don't have time, so I would say this would be the last question. And um, yes, I think so. That's why we're interested in all this scenario data. Of course, you know, it's always a challenge to have a present day assessment yet on vulnerability to agree on methods. Let's say there are many different methods available to do that. But of course, we would like to interest, and that's also our concept to see this as monitoring units. And of course, they may, they may change then.
And also your first comment in regard to the administrative boundaries, yes, I also agree, it's also feedback we receive a lot, so, but you know, the information can be aggregated also coming from, either from your underlying indicators, but also from the GEONs, let's say, vulnerability index, also to an administrative unit, also showing, okay, the percentage of an area being in Kenya, let's say, or, or being affected. So I think it's also important, of course, having the administrative boundary as a reporting unit because they are obliged to, at the district level, to report to the national level. So that's also possible to, to aggregate them. But we have, uh, wanted being interested in going a little bit beyond pixel approaches and also administrative boundaries. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next uh, presenter is uh, Patrick Gerland. Uh, uh, I'll do the presentation seated, sorry. Uh, my, I'm, I'm somewhat older, so I need to see the screen uh, closer to me. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the presentation and the paper is about uh, the risk of exposure of uh, major uh, world cities to natural hazards. And uh, it builds on the work, uh, on some of the work that we are doing in the UN related to urbanization. It's a uh, collective work uh, uh, from several of, uh, with several of my colleagues in the UN. And uh, um, <coughs> I'll go through a couple of, uh, uh, let's say, key uh, aspects of this, uh, uh, of these results. Uh, one is why, uh, in the first place, uh, uh, it's interesting and useful to focus on cities. Um, first is that uh, uh, even if the definition of what is urban, uh, country by country, is somewhat uh, subjective to the local context of each country, overall you have a, a, today more than half of the world population that lives in some type of, uh, let's say, urban areas. And uh, um, from different assessments that have been done, uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic productivity, the overwhelming uh, uh, economic production is concentrated in urban areas. And uh, uh, when it comes to climate change and uh, the uh, impact of uh, humans on, on climate, uh, cities and uh, the lifestyles of people uh, living in cities and eventually economies uh, concentrated in urban areas are responsible for most of the emissions and energy consumption. So this concentration in space of humans uh, is, is an important uh, human dimension and uh, when it comes to, uh, for example, assessing and eventually mitigating uh, uh, risk of exposure to different types of natural hazards, uh, the, the fact that uh, humans are concentrated and more and more concentrated in specific locations is an important piece of uh, information that uh, can be helpful in terms of guiding policies and eventually priorities. Um, and. Uh, uh, <clears throat> what you might have seen in the media, in, uh, and it's kind of uh, uh, somewhat, uh, I think, increasing over the last several, uh, couple of uh, years, is an increasing uh, set of uh, private or public initiatives of uh, different groups of cities. You have a group of, let's say, 40 major cities uh, called the C40 cities. You have... Uh, um, the, you have the Rockefeller Foundation, for example, that have set up some uh, global initiative on uh, 100 uh, uh, major cities with uh, specific resilience uh, strategies. You have uh, um, headlines, regular headlines in the BBC or uh, a, a number of international uh, uh, media about uh, uh, the, what specific cities are doing in respect to different types of environmental uh, uh, challenges or climate change related challenges that they are facing. You have uh, the recent IPCC report uh, and the uh, World Urban Forum uh, that happened a couple of weeks ago that uh, looked specifically in the context of uh, cities uh, and uh, uh, urban planning, what and how eventually they are dealing with some of the challenges that they are facing. So as a, a statistical unit of analysis, it, cities are as a, a uh, several uh, other people earlier were uh, uh, mentioning it. It's 
they have uh, some meaning and uh, in terms of policy and intervention. They are a functional level of uh, uh, that uh, uh, is useful to, to work with and to look at. Uh, the, the, um, the paper itself focuses on the risk of exposure to uh, major natural hazards and uh, um, by the type of data that we are in the UN involved with, let's say, uh, analyzing, we focus on the major urban areas. Uh, and uh, the question that we, we try to look at were basically what are the cities that are the most exposed to the most risk? Uh, which are of these cities have been growing in terms of population expansion the fastest? and have been uh, eventually exposed to the greater risk. Uh, and uh, and uh, eventually also, what are the largest cities that are eventually the least exposed to these uh, natural disasters that have happened in the past? Uh, <coughs> so we use basically two types of data. One is the, the, the UN data set that we are involved in uh, assembling, which is called the World Urbanization Prospect. It's revised every two years. And uh, this work was done using the 2011 assessment. And uh, for the purpose of this analysis, we focus on major urban areas of 750,000 or more. Uh, so it's about 633 uh, major cities. And uh, <coughs> one of the uh, deficiency of this data is we don't really know uh, with precision the urban extent that this population data relate to. So for the purpose of this analysis, we use two uh, buffers. One uh, uh, is a two kilometer and another a five kilometer buffer around the centroid uh, of each of these urban locations. So it's an approximation and eventually in uh, further analysis uh, later this year or next year, we might try to do something more precise. Uh, in terms of the universe of uh, uh, this uh, population data set, Overall, uh, we monitor over 5,000 urban locations. Uh, but we publish uh, uh, until uh, uh, 2011 only about 11% of this uh, database. Um, the, the new assessment will bring down the threshold to 300,000 inhabitants instead of 750,000 inhabitants. Uh, the other aspect is uh, to what extent uh, the information that comes from particular census of different sources of information can be used. Uh, one of the challenges is basically that uh, uh, for uh, small areas, especially in this case, let's say cities, the primary source are censuses. So you are dependent basically of when a country is doing a census and to what extent the data of that census are available. So if you look at the distribution of data point across all the countries over the last uh, 50 years, or 60 years, you see these spikes around the years that most countries are doing their census. And uh, at the, uh, within a country, because many countries have been doing at least a, decade, uh, a census per decade, you easily have five or six data points. Uh, what it means is if you take a city like uh, uh, Guwahati in, uh, in India, um, India is one of the countries that has been doing census for the past century uh, all, uh, every decade. So you have literally since 1901 the possibility to see with this kind of, uh, I don't know if you can see the dots, you can see some, some dots. These are each of the census in India, except at least in one uh, uh, census where this particular city uh, uh, was not covered by the census. Um, in the case of a city like Lagos in Nigeria, uh, the census information are more, let's say, challenging and you have eventually other, uh, uh, let's say, more uh, unofficial estimates of population that comes from different sources. And uh, depending eventually which data points are eventually included or not in the analysis, it, it does eventually change the slope of some of the uh, future trends you might eventually extrapolate. So there are a couple of challenges related to the definition of what is being measured, what are the sources of data that are being used, but overall you get this kind of geographic coverage of major urban areas, about 5,000 urban areas worldwide, uh, based on different population size. And uh, as you can see, the distribution is uh, uh, of course concentrated in the uh, countries where you have the most people living, which are basically Asia, uh, but uh, <coughs> Uh, 
as I said, we, we have about 5,000 plus uh, cities, and uh, depending the threshold you focus on, of course, the number of cities increase with the smaller size uh, uh, you include in the analysis. The other data set we have used is a, a GIS uh, set of layers that was assembled by CSIN and uh, a consortium of different other partners um, and uh, was published in 2005 by Delay and colleagues on natural disaster hotspots. And uh, it's a public uh, data set, uh, uh, let's say it's a gridded data set that gives you for six uh, natural hazards um, the uh, a risk of exposure to cyclones and landslides at about one kilometer resolution, earthquake and volcanoes at about five, five kilometer resolution, and floods, uh, as well as droughts. Now, as you can see, depending the natural uh, hazard risk, the scale are somewhat different. The time horizon that are used in each of these uh, uh, layers are mostly from the 1980s onward, but for the volcanoes, it goes back to uh, the uh, turn to the antiquity uh, uh, period. Now, uh, for the uh, for the exposure to the risk, the uh, the authors have basically used decile uh, distributions, and uh, the the third uh, top decile is considered to be the highest uh, risk uh, of exposure. And if you uh, overlay uh, the exposure to multiple risk you can get this multi-hazard index of being exposed not just to one risk, but to, uh, uh, simultaneously to two, three, or more uh, risks. And uh, another uh, layer that we have also considered was uh, the uh, distance to the coast, uh, or to what extent a city is on a coastal uh, region or not. And that was based on the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, also available through CSIN. So, uh, in terms of uh, worldwide distribution of this uh, universe of, let's say, 630 plus uh, cities, um, you can look at it first in terms of the population growth that have occurred since the 1970s, let's say, and you can see uh, a concentration in Asia, but also in parts of Africa, of some of the fastest uh, urban population growth. Um, and this is without uh, taking into account the exposure to natural hazards. Now, if you, uh, if you uh, want to keep in mind uh, the, um, the projections we are doing at the national level of the world population, is that uh, um, within, uh, uh, between today and 2050, you, have, uh, you will have about uh, uh, two, two billion plus extra people that are uh, forecasted. And this is pretty much almost with, uh, even if you make an assumption that uh, every country would reach uh, uh, instant replacement, uh, it's pretty much the effect of the momentum. So it's at least two, two billion extra people expected in the next uh, 40 years. And uh, from what we have uh, uh, estimated in terms of urbanization trends, most of these people are going to live uh, in urban areas. Uh, what we forecast is about 2.8 uh, 2 billion people more in urban areas uh, uh, by 2050. And uh, uh, the, the basically, the, the, the most, most of the uh, growth of these uh, uh, 2 billion extra people will be happening mostly in urban areas. So these cities that have been growing in the past are going to be uh, 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 they call this. You will have extra cities that are going to, to keep growing, and the question is uh, which are the cities that are growing and are eventually exposed to some of these uh, risks and to what extent they can do eventually in their planning, in their, in their expansion, better uh, plans to deal with some of those risks. Uh, among the, uh, these uh, 630 uh, plus cities, about 60% of the, uh, the population of these cities are exposed to at least one risk of natural hazard. Um, and uh, uh, for a smaller subset of about 100 cities, uh, they have been exposed at least to two uh, different types of natural hazard over the last, uh, let's say, 30 years. Um, and uh, uh, quite a number of uh, the mega cities of the 10 million plus cities in 2011 uh, have been exposed uh, themselves to at least one type of natural hazard. Uh, 
the cities that have been the, the least exposed, uh, uh, at least over the last 30 plus years, are mostly concentrated in Europe and Africa. Um, when you look at the uh, multi-risk kind of exposure, the most exposed to multiple risks are concentrated in Asia and uh, uh, to some extent uh, on the, uh, in some parts of Latin America. Um, the, uh, the question becomes after of what are the risks that each of these places are exposed the most. And uh, in, the, uh, in the report that we have online, you, you can see uh, more detailed tabulations of uh, uh, what are the cities uh, that are the most exposed uh, based on their population size and uh, the multiple risk of exposure in uh, uh, Manila, for example, in terms of uh, being one of the largest cities uh, that has the most exposure or is exposed to risk of cyclones, floods, but also quakes. Uh, and uh, <coughs> in that category, you have a number of other cities in Asia, like Taipei, uh, Davao in the Philippines, uh, several cities in China that have a, a multiple risk like this of both quakes, but eventually also risk of exposure to flood or landslides or to cyclones. So, hmm? five minutes? Okay. So I'll move forward. <laughs> uh, if you look uh, in terms of the, the, the trend over time, of the, if you classify all these cities based on their risk, let's say single risk or multiple risk of exposure, uh, and you look at their population trends over time, what you see here in terms of, uh, let's say, layers of population uh, is the cities uh, 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 that are exposed to the greater number of risk, natural hazard risk, are also some of those that have been growing the fastest, uh, faster than those that have been exposed to, to lesser risk. And you can look uh, more detailed in the paper in terms of the breakdown by uh, regions, uh, uh, economic regions of development, uh, as well as uh, in terms of uh, 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 some other characteristics. In terms of what are the two most frequent natural hazard risks that uh, most of these cities have been exposed, the two dominant ones are the floods and the droughts. Um, floods and droughts are the two biggest uh, issues, uh, and the third one are the cyclones. Uh, floods are concentrated in Asia and in America in terms of uh, uh, city exposure. And uh, you can see on the map the red are these uh, uh, cities the mo that have been most exposed to, to floods since 19 1985, between 1985 and 2003. Uh, in, if you look at the MDAT uh, database, in terms of uh, number of events, uh, uh, number of people killed and total affected worldwide, uh, flood, droughts, and cyclones are the, the three major risks that uh, uh, have affected the most people worldwide uh, within uh, the data set that MDAT is tracking. So uh, in terms of exposure, the second one are the droughts, and those droughts uh, are concentrated in the Indian subcontinent in terms of exposure uh, for cities, but also in some uh, parts of the Americas, and to a lesser extent in some uh, of the cities in Africa. But the African context here is also, right now, the result of the population size of the cities that are included in the analysis. Uh, the cyclones are predominantly concentrated in Asia, and to some extent also on the uh, coastline of, of the eastern side of the US. Uh, the coastal cities themselves are exposed to a double risk of exposure of the cyclones and the floods. And uh, uh, the, uh, when you look at uh, uh, the breakdown of uh, coastal cities, they, uh, quite a few of them have this double risk of exposure. Um, earthquakes, I will skip. Um, for more detail, uh, I encourage you eventually to look at some of these uh, tables that we have online about uh, uh, the breakdown of uh, uh, cities by uh, the, their size and their risk of different exposures in terms of their growth, which of these cities have been growing the fastest and are the more exposed to risk. Uh, in terms of low risk of exposure, uh, cities like Moscow, but also Cairo uh, or Kinshasa uh, have been uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, exposure to different type of uh, these different type of natural hazards, the least exposed over the last several decades. Uh, they have eventually other challenges to deal with, but in terms of natural exposure, they are much less exposed to those risks. Uh, what do you do with this kind of information? 
uh, in the context of uh, uh, planning, uh, to some extent, uh, the cities that are exposed to multiple risk uh, eventually need to, to be more prepared to deal with some of those challenges. And uh, uh, in the context of the relationship with the population aspect, uh, some of the colleagues we have in uh, the NYU urban planning program are interested to collaborate with us and UN Habitat on some uh, further research on the urban expansion component. Uh, urban planners are really in usually focusing on what do you do for the future in terms of the urban expansion. And uh, in that context, to know which cities are growing faster and where eventually cities are ex more the most vulnerable or exposed to risk is important in terms of, for example, of infrastructure planning and eventually allocating uh, uh, land for building. Thank you. So questions, please. Okay, so uh, Patrick will respond to each question one by one. Thank you. A uh, very, very interesting presentation. I'm just wondering if uh, you have a sense of the uncertainty about these types of risks. Like uh, you're talking about planning, and in those terms, like uh, getting an idea of whether uncertainty is high or low about these estimates may be relevant. And so I'm just wondering if uh, you thought about it or. The, the uncertainty about uh, uh, this work is uh, you have uh, two types of uncertainties. Uh, one is uh, uh, what's the population you, are, you, you, you measure. And uh, the, in that context, the biggest uncertainty is really more the, um, the relation between the space and uh, the population you are measuring. To what extent the, the, the population figures that you have uh, refer to a specific uh, uh, spatial unit. Um, the accuracy of the census themselves, yes, the census are never totally perfect, but uh, usually they are not completely wrong. So in terms of all the uncertainty, the, the, the uncertainty you have actually about uh, the natural hazards in that context, especially the spatial resolution that you have uh, and the time, the time series that exists for many of these natural risks is more problematic in that context. Uh, in especially if you are interested for local planning. Uh, these uh, uh, global layers that exist currently are, I think, useful for, let's say, planetary type of uh, research to get kind of the big picture. But uh, I work for a year in, uh, uh, in Paris uh, uh, regional uh, uh, planning authorities, uh, and I have seen it over the years with several colleagues involved with uh, regional urban planning. The scale you work when you do urban planning and infrastructure planning is a different scale. What you need is much more detail than what you have at the global scale. So you have, you have to deal with two different uh, types of issues. You, uh, both of them are, are complementary. Uh, and the uncertainty in this case, uh, in addition to all that, is if you are doing projections, is yes, you should try to incorporate the, uh, some of this uncertainty as well as in the future. But uh, my experience so far is that for urban planners, what they are interested in the next 20, 30 years. To give them projections up to the end of the century, it's not usually that practical or useful. You don't plan airports uh, 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 for 90 years from now. You do it for the next 20, 30 years. Uh, uh, that's all. If you are able to achieve already uh, uh, proper planning, it's important because, uh, uh, for example, when you plan most of the infrastructure, if you, are if you expect your city to triple in size, which is the reality of many of the cities in the world, it means you have to really plan seriously uh, uh, your uh, road network and eventually uh, the, t the transport network in your city. It takes time to build a, a serious infrastructure. And many cities uh, have not been doing this planning. In the case of uh, uh, this, uh, this work eventually fits uh, in the context of uh, uh, UN Habitat 3 uh, uh, conference that will happen in 2016. Uh, the uh, UN Habitat right now is run by the former mayor of Barcelona. Uh, 
and uh, uh, UN Habitat has, has also included in their, um, let's say, group of uh, um, uh, eminent people involved, uh, mayors of, uh, former mayor of New York City like Bloomberg and so on. So there is a number of, let's say, rather uh, high profile uh, local leaders that have been, been involved in managing uh, uh, major urban centers uh, involved in getting more and more cities involved in doing something about uh, better planning for the future, including dealing with uh, some of these climate change issues. Charles uh, Taylor. Yes, um, I think this is very, very useful data, particularly for those who teach courses uh, for our students. Uh, I want to uh, talk, uh, mention uh, two of the issues we're facing in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, one is that the fastest uh, uh, population growth rates in urban areas are not in the largest cities in most of our countries. And the governments are most concerned about the rapid growth rates in the smaller, the market towns and uh, maybe the middle size uh, cities. The most concerned because one, they don't have the infrastructure. They don't have environmental sanitation. And second, they don't have the uh, institutional response capacity when there are these uh, 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 disasters. Uh, so given uh, th those the double burden <laughs> of the very fast growth rates and uh, lack of capacity, uh, would you, uh, and, and the third is that the, the, the most vulnerable populations uh, are often uh, not in the largest uh, cities, the percentage of vulnerable are often in the smaller, smaller cities. So given those three considerations, uh, might you consider also projecting the uh, growth rates uh, of the most highly vulnerable peoples and also that capacity to, to deal with them in the smaller places? Uh, ideally, yes. Uh, in practice, uh, it's, uh, there is an issue of uh, economy of scale in terms of the uh, information and the access to this information for small areas, as you describe. What you describe is uh, basically what uh, uh, GPW, what CESIN is uh, attempting to do, or AFRIPOP and other groups are doing. For uh, It's a trade-off between spatial resolution and uh, time trend. Uh, if your focus is to be as uh, uh, local as possible, then you need to go with uh, uh, high resolution data. And in this case, uh, uh, you are seldom going to be able to have long time trends available uh, unless you focus on a, on, a sp on a particular small area, a province, a country. Uh, if you want to do global, go global scale uh, products, it's it's unfortunately not that straightforward to be able to have the time, the resource, the manpower, and the access to all the information you need to go beyond eventually one or two decades. The priority of, for example, CESIN has been from the 1990s onward. Uh, so if you are interested by one decade or two decade uh, data products, you start to have more and more eventually different type of layers of information that exist and as you know, uh, as soon as you want to do something really more refined, as, you, as it has been discussed today and in the previous days, in terms of vulnerability with all kinds of additional uh, socio-economic cultural covariates, you need to have access to the, to the census information and eventually to, to additional surveys to give you all the, the much more specific information. And very often, if you really want to do ideally what uh, you, I guess what you, you want to do is you need to link census and survey together. And it, it really means that unless you are in the country and have access to all of this information, it's very difficult to do out of the country, especially at the global scale. Uh, so it's a, you have basically to find the right balance of what are the global products that uh, are uh, achievable within uh, limited resources. And, and it's not that... It's not that we don't want to do it. Uh, it's more a matter of trade-off. Now, you have a, um, in the background of this kind of work, you have a project like Terrapop, Terrapopoulos. This is, an, uh, I believe, an NSF-funded project uh, 
in collaboration with Ciesin, but primarily with uh, uh, the IPUMS uh, uh, Minnesota Population Center. Uh, in a, first in a couple of countries, I believe Malawi, Brazil, uh, a, a couple of countries first, but the idea is to scale it up to as many countries as possible where IPUMS, has already, IPUMS International has already been able to have access to the full census uh, uh, micro data set is to be able to provide for a small area, as small as possible, uh, uh, comparable uh, over time, uh, all, the, the, all the indicators of the census uh, aggregated at the smallest possible geographic area with, with the boundaries and combining it with uh, uh, geospatial layers from remote sensing. So you will be able to do what you, you can already do with IPIMS International with the micro data, but this time for small area, with comparable small area, going back as far as you can go in each country where the, sen the census micro data exists, and for every covariate you can have access to, combined with geospatial layers. But that you, you will most likely be able to do it at best within the next five to 10 years, probably for 20, 30, maybe 50 countries of the world, not for the whole world. Uh, Wolfgang? Thank you very much. I have one short comment and one question. The comment is that the statement that is frequently made and, and you also made is that most of the population growth will happen in urban areas. Uh, is only correct in one sense, but it's also misleading because I've heard people saying, well, because the UN said this, we should focus family planning efforts on urban areas because that's where the growth happens. Of course, most of these additional two billion people are still being born in the rural areas, I assume, and then they migrate uh, to the, uh, and even if there would be no additional births, still there would be rural to urban migration. So I think this has to be communicated also in a more subtle way because otherwise it can be easily misunderstood by non-demographers. Uh, my question is related uh, to the uh, issue of the, the drought uh, as, a, as a risk for cities. Uh, while flooding is, is very clearly and immediately a threat to cities, and actually I think big cities such as Manila, as you mentioned, or Bangkok, as a matter of fact, should start thinking now about relocating and moving their future infrastructure somewhere to higher uh, levels. Uh, but drought is, is affecting cities, I assume, through uh, clean water, drinking water, and, and food supply but many of the megacities actually bring their water and their food from far away. So it's not really the, the, the heat and the drought in the location of the city, but where they uh, draw their food and water from that matters, and, and maybe that is, makes it less direct and a threat. Thank you. Yes, for the first point, you are absolutely right. Uh, the, the statement should be more cautious, uh, and yes, uh, it's more about, uh, uh, for urban areas, to deal uh, uh, with the fact that uh, uh, they will face increasing, let's say, uh, number of people. And many of these people will not be born themselves in, this, in those cities, in these uh, expanding cities. Uh, but uh, uh, they will still have to face the fact that they will have an increasing number of people moving to those cities. Uh, now, in terms of the droughts, you're also right that uh, uh, the adaptation or the challenge for cities to deal with drought is very different than to deal with flood. Uh, I agree. Uh, the, the drought is more about the stress uh, that uh, these uh, major urban centers create on their uh, uh, surrounding environments. And as you saw even yesterday in the presentation for this uh, uh, region, uh, to get uh, clean water means to bring the clean water from elsewhere in the, and that eventually also affects uh, farming and so on. So uh, in that context, uh, to put a drought in the same category as flood, I, I agree that it's not, uh, it's not the same, I, I agree. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is for my understanding. You have said that uh, two to five kilometer buffer under city has been considered. So uh, I would like to know that why this two to, three, two to five kilometer buffer has been considered. And uh, following to this question is, is this uh, buffer is different for different class of cities? So uh, what, I ex what I was very briefly trying to explain is, uh, here is an example, uh, or I can take <coughs> Delhi, for example, for, for your purpose, Delhi. Uh, 
um, <coughs> what we know <coughs> is uh, the population for uh, Delhi as an, as an urban agglomeration, the greater Delhi. And the greater Delhi is basically, in our, for our purpose, it's a population number in a particular year and a location in the form of a latitude, longitude, that you have like the pins. You see these yellow pins? By default, that's the only thing we know. Uh, and uh, if you take the census of India, by default, what you get is a tabular uh, data set on the right side that gives you some population numbers for different administrative units. And uh, um, <coughs> what, uh, what is the urban limit of Delhi? or the greater Delhi, uh, is uh, uh, we agreed it for that in, in most instances it's some, somewhat proportionate to the population size of this urban area. Uh, but uh, uh, by default, in the data set that we have access, uh, we do not know the area. So uh, for purpose of very crude approximation, we did the uh, analysis by using a fixed circular buffer of two kilometer radius, and as a sensitivity kind of analysis using a five kilometer radius. Uh, two kilometer, five kilometer radius uh, in, in a city like Delhi would mean basically more like the core uh, urban center. It, and here, in this kind of satellite imagery from Google Earth, uh, I overlaid two types of uh, uh, urban extent. One is the red urban extent that corresponds to the nighttime lights uh, uh, um, uh, delimit delimitation that uh, CSIN used when they prepared the GROUP uh, uh, data product. Uh, and then the blue uh, urban extent uh, correspond to the uh, MODIS 500 uh, satellite imagery uh, for urban uh, classification of around 2000. So you can see that in principle in 2000 you should have a, a larger area than in, in 1990. But you are using two, if you use two different classifications you get two different areas. Uh, which one is meaningful? It depends on the analysis. Uh, if you are really interested by the urban core, you want usually to focus more on the, on the bluish one. If you are interested by the larger kind of metropolitan area of Delhi, you probably want to get the reddish one. So it, it depends very much uh, what I, is the purpose of the analysis. But uh, uh, until we are able to really to have this linkage between uh, physical extent and population, the first approximation we used was a simple uh, a fixed buffer, but uh, in the further analysis we plan to do, we will uh, try to get into something more proportionate to the population size and to the real extent that exists for each of the cities. So, thank you, Patrick. <laughs> so I invite uh, Mark Montgomery. Well, it's a... Uh, Pleasure to uh, follow Stefan and, and Patrick. Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, the work I'm going to describe connects uh, in a number of ways uh, to what you've just heard from uh, those two excellent presentations. Let's see if I can pull this up. There we go. Um, I'll discuss uh, uh, a piece of a much larger research project that is focused on, uh, as the other uh, presentations have been, on extreme event uh, risks, the implications for adaptation. I'll um, illustrate uh, the issues, both in terms of concepts, uh, data, and, and methods, with the example of Guatemala, which, um, much like the Philippines, as we were hearing yesterday, has the full menu of disasters uh, available. Um, uh, it's it's uh, a country that is beset by a, a, a range of, of uh, challenges, let us, let us say. Um, after an overview, I want to talk about an issue that uh, we have circled around uh, over the last uh, few days, but I think not directly engaged with, and that is a question of um, what mechanisms uh, are being used or should be used in the future uh, to make a record of the consequences of, of disasters. Right? Um, that is uh, a difficulty in the logical transition from exposure to hazards uh, to the actual uh, uh, the material, the, the 
uh, cases in which those hazards materialize on the ground and the harm that they cause immediately and then further down, down the road. So as we look ahead, we're going to need to think hard, I, I would say, about what sorts of data collection or statistical mechanisms will be required to get an adequate account of the evidence uh, on the ground. Um, so as Patrick did, um, uh, in fact, using the same uh, data sources that he, that he has used uh, in, the, in the UN paper, I'll uh, show you with reference to one country, uh, the range of, uh, of risks that, in this case, Guatemala experiences. And I will use uh, the world pop population density rasters, which are uh, uh, high resolution rasters, to give you an idea of not only the total population exposed uh, to each of these risks, but also, um, and again using methods similar to what Patrick has described, an estimate of the urban populations exposed uh, to the risks. Then we'll get to the heart of the presentation, which is about um, uh, a very interesting large program, uh, had its origins in Latin America, as many of these uh, innovative programs have had, uh, called Disinventar. Uh, uh, that uh, Disinventar is, uh, think of an inventory of disasters, uh, protocols, methods, and databases that are consistently applied across, uh, across countries are now available. And I want to uh, present this resource to you, um, show you what it, what it can be used for, and then step back and ask, is this kind of mechanism adequate uh, for the kinds of hazards that we expect to be facing? Okay. So I, I will say the overarching point, um, which I, I'm sure many of us would, would, would agree with, um, is that for those of us who are in the, 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 the world of, of demography, the challenge that faces us is how to connect the data that, to which we have access, demographic, social, economic data, to uh, the hazard exposure data that generally come to us from other sciences uh, altogether. Um, one point that I hope to leave you with, uh, uh, about which I feel strongly, is that uh, we can provide uh, 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 a great deal of value added by using the materials that are routinely collected um, every 10 years or thereabouts, population censuses, but disaggregating them uh, uh, in ways that have not typically been done. There's, there is gold there, that is, uh, and that is not a technical task that should daunt any of today's uh, national statistical agencies. There are technical issues, but I think it's a question of bureaucratic and political willingness uh, uh, to understand what can be achieved in this way. So many of us have talked about different types of extreme events. Uh, Wolfgang just now uh, uh, drew a distinction between um, flooding as a sudden onset extreme event and droughts or water scarcity as a, a, a kind of event that um, evolves uh, more slowly over time. Um, we certainly know, as, as the uh, other presenters have, have discussed, that certain types of extreme events, uh, flooding in particular, in the case of Guatemala, as we'll see, uh, uh, landslides are also important, uh, cause a great deal of harm to both rural and urban populations alike. We're far less um, sure about the implications and the consequences of water scarcity and periods of drought. And what I want to circle back to at the end is a question of are different data mechanisms, uh, disaster recording me mechanisms, going to be needed to cope with these two very different forms of, of hazard. So as uh, previous presenters have done, I, I will um, bring some focus uh, on the urban dimension here. I won't repeat what, what Patrick has said in his uh, excellent uh, presentation, but only to make uh, or lay emphasis on two points. First, that if we uh, look hard at national adaptation programs of action, they very seldom even mention urban populations to say nothing of the, the urban poor. And so in the first generation of such plans, uh, the urban component of national populations has been all but ignored, uh, with only a few exceptions, really. I'm hopeful that the IPCC uh, emphasis on social and economic consequences more generally will right the, the balance in, in, in the future, but certainly that's been the experience to date. 
Also, as uh, uh, Charles and others have mentioned, it is vitally important to keep our eye on where, generally speaking, the majority of urban residents live. That's not in the mega cities, but rather intermediate size and even small urban areas. The data challenges are very much uh, there and present, uh, but we can't continue to imagine that the urban world is a world of huge places. That is a misleading picture of the, uh, the population that we're considered with, considering. And then, as others have, have said, I, I, in addition to the urban dimension, the spatial dimension is uh, essential to keep in mind. Uh, even within the space of a relatively small, uh, geographically speaking, uh, country like Guatemala, hazards manifest themselves uh, uh, differently and with different frequency across relatively small geographic distances. And so if we're to bring evidence to bear on the question of adaptation, that evidence simply must be spatially specific to the greatest extent that we can achieve at, at the moment. And fortunately, there is an enormous amount of progress being made. Um, this year is qualitatively different in respect to the availability of spatial data than two years ago. It's a stunning uh, amount of activity is, is underway. So to begin, I'll try to map for you, uh, for Guatemala, uh, first in you know, very crude, uh, broad uh, strokes, uh, the total numbers of people exposed to different kinds of events and the total numbers of urban residents in cities small uh, to large in that country. Um, I'll make use of the world pop rasters, which um, uh, others have mentioned. Uh, I'll show you a couple of, of images um, uh, and also draw on some of the other sources that are mentioned here. So the notion of this, of this project is to proceed um, uh, with a broad, using a broad brush, uh, looking across a set of countries, and, and you'll see those countries in a moment, um, making use of data in the public domain, as available to anyone here, as, as, as uh, to, to our research team, to portray and begin to um, uh, uh, prioritize uh, risks according to the levels of population uh, exposed to them. That, uh, so our work is very much uh, across country, you wouldn't say global, but certainly the procedures that we use would only provide a, a starting portrait uh, that would uh, uh, be important for country specific research. There's no substitute uh, for country specific uh, uh, research here. So to get to the main uh, items then. So how do we know where disasters have taken place? Uh, we've seen, and I'll show for Guatemala, what EMDAT, the International uh, uh, Recording System, uh, records. Uh, it tells us what countries and in what times disasters have struck and does not tell us any more than that uh, as far as the spatial specificity. Um, Disinventar, uh, the program that I'll describe and, and uh, illustrate, aims to provide the most spatially specific accounting of uh, the occurrence of disasters. Both these uh, offer data that are in the public domain. Okay. Ah. The, program, the countries that have participated in the disinventar program are shown here. Um, I will focus on, will this show up, I wonder? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Guatemala, uh, uh, right here. Um, the, there is an underrepresentation of this program in Asia, although India is shown here. In fact, there are only two states, Tamil Nadu and Orissa, that uh, fielded uh, the uh, disinventar program. But data sets from all the countries outlined here are, are in the public domain. Now, for Guatemala, uh, if we turn to EMDAT, the international source, we see that, um, much as, as Patrick has mentioned, uh, the major disasters, the top 10 uh, list, so to speak, of, of disasters in this country have included droughts, earthquakes, floods, storms, uh, you name it. Right? But we don't know exactly where in the country, from this data source, those events took place. I'll show you the spatial aspect of, of uh, what lies behind this slide, but to give you a sense from the disinventar program, which began in 1988 and uh, continues. Uh, the most recent version of the data that we have is 2011. Uh, it is possible uh, some uh, 5,000 or more 
specific events were recorded. Uh, and these are the summaries over that span of time and uh, the number of events um, of deaths, injuries, uh, illnesses and other types of, of harm, uh, evacuations, relocations, uh, and the destruction or damage of, of housing that have taken place over, over time. There are more indicators um, gathered in the disinventory data than I'm showing here. The important point, I think, for uh, the future is that the system that produces these numbers is one in which each event is critically examined by a team of researchers according to criteria and protocols um, that declare the, the, uh, the, the location of the event and the amount of harm uh, it brought on. Um, as uh, uh, events are, are classified as, as uh, uh, needing further documentation or not, teams are then sent out uh, to collect the further documentation. So there's a process of critical analysis and vetting applied to these uh, events that I think is very uh, important. All right. The, um, to uh, get a sense of the population exposed to different sorts of hazards and the populations within which events have actually materialized, we'll use the population uh, density rasters from WorldPOP. Um, an advantage of this uh, particular summary of uh, population density is that it applies to rural areas as well as to urban. In a map of this scale, the urban areas stand out uh, because of their higher density more clearly. So here is Guatemala City, for example. You might have uh, known that, although would not have had the estimates of population density. Uh, from uh, nighttime lights data, the modern version of the nighttime lights is called uh, VIRS, quite spatially specific, a uh, great improvement over the uh, light images that Patrick was describing um, from a few years ago. Right? The nighttime lights do not show rural populations, whereas the population raster is at least modeled in a way that should reveal uh, uh, total numbers of rural residents and, and, re and relative concentrations across space. Uh, from other sources, uh, one can collect information on the populations of cities. Uh, this is at a point in time, but there's also information on city growth. Um, here, I've, you see again Guatemala City. You may be able to perceive uh, uh, some of the other cities uh, whose sizes are roughly indicated in this, this diagram from small to large. Um, there are time series of uh, city size associated with these. They have not been subjected to the same kind of critical analysis that the UN Population Division applies year after year uh, and city after city to its data set. So the data exist, they need to be scrutinized uh, more than they have been to date. As Patrick discussed, uh, to uh, get a sense, a crude sense of uh, to the exposure to risk of, of these rural and urban populations, we'll use the so-called hotspots data. Thank you. For Guatemala, uh, here is a spatial depiction of the levels of risk of uh, cyclone or hurricane, as we would say in our hemisphere. And you can see below the city, cities that are in the spatial path, uh, the storm tracks collected here. For landslides, which as we'll see uh, shortly, are very important in the, in the Guatemalan context. The darker regions that you see here are regions of higher landslide risk as estimated from uh, models based on elevation, moisture, soil type, and so forth. The flooding risks that uh, Patrick described are actually those of river flooding. And not sure how well you can see this, but there are areas of relatively high risk and lower risk. And then drought. Well, uh, the western half of Guatemala is in a very high drought prone region, uh, which includes uh, a number of the, the cities and towns of, of, of this country. But as, as Wolfgang pointed out, it is certainly possible that the population living here can be affected by drought taking place here. Right? And so mere spatial coincidence is not enough, uh, certainly in an event of this kind. Okay. Well, we have uh, uh, overlaid the population density rasters and the positions of the, uh, the, the cities against these uh, kinds of risk maps and derive from them estimates of total population exposed to different uh, kinds of risks, much as Patrick did in a more global uh, presentation just a few moments ago. But if you look here, um, 
let's say in the landslide category, uh, Guatemala has about 14 million uh, uh, population. Uh, 3.7 are in a, uh, a, a category exposed to appreciable risks of landslide, half a million in the highest uh, risk class in that case. Uh, flooding can be characterized in that way. Most of the country is spatially in the region in which droughts take place and exposed in that sense. And of course, exposure could be uh, even greater. And that includes 3.8 million urban residents in those regions. Now, what does this inventory bring to this picture? Against a background of exposure uh, uh, generated by scientific models, uh, uh, it provides information on uh, the disasters uh, events that have actually taken place, at least those that are, that are captured by the recording system of disinventar. And so this shows you uh, uh, flooding events by municipio, if you know that uh, level of, of uh, spatial unit, um, uh, across the space of Guatemala. Remember, here is Guatemala City, and one of the reddest parts of this map, uh, it's not good to be red, um, is in uh, the, the neighborhood of Guatemala City. Uh, landslides uh, also have been, their spatial incidents roughly uh, parallels uh, the exposure to risk uh, 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 probabilistic estimates from the scientific models. If we look at uh, homes that were destroyed by floods, so uh, there are many uh, 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 types of harm uh, described in this data set, but uh, homes destroyed or damaged, I think, are two of the uh, uh, most interesting ones to consider. Um, there's quite a bit of damage uh, over the, uh, the period here in regions, some of which is in regions uh, thought to be at high flood risk, whether from river or from cyclone, uh, hurricane. Uh, others in, in regions that might not have been considered such high risk. Okay. And where damage is concerned, uh, there's uh, even greater variation uh, to, to consider. For landslides, again, using homes uh, destroyed as a, an indicator, the reddest part of this map is within uh, greater the, uh, Guatemala City. In the poorer uh, regions of this city that are located in peril, right? Much as, was, uh, as we were hearing about for uh, the Philippines uh, yeah, yesterday, and likewise uh, damage. Okay, so let me uh, come uh, to a, a conclusion. What these data sources brought together um, show us is where, according to the uh, uh, physical and biophysical scientists, um, risks are greatest, where according to a, a particular kind of disaster record keeping system, the risks, the, those risks have actually materialized on the ground. We do not know, uh, so we know something about the geography and the frequency, but from this sort of um, combination of sources, we don't know who it is who has experienced those, uh, uh, those harms. Right? Um, in particular, disinventar does not collect uh, information on the age, the sex, the migration status, the education, the poverty level of those individuals whose houses were destroyed or damaged in landslides or floods. That's beyond the scope of that data collection uh, uh, system. And so the kinds of uh, issues that uh, uh, Emilio is pointing to uh, on day one of our, of our uh, uh, time together, uh, is the sex differential in uh, disaster harm uh, what we thought it was, uh, are not answerable. Uh, by, by, by this mechanism. Um, it is possible to use the uh, qualitative accounts of, of individual disasters that disinventar provides to get a little bit more spatial sp specificity, but that still does not tell you if you know street and intersection, as we do in, in a number of cases. That still doesn't tell you who, uh, who lived there and what, what sort of family, what uh, precisely was exposed. For the moment, the best we can do on the who question with this, uh, this kind of information is to make use of uh, detailed municipio and below levels of, of census data. Uh, we're fortunate in our project uh, to have access to the micro records for the Guatemalan census of uh, 2002, and with luck, uh, uh, the more recent census as well. That still does not quite close the connection you know the, the nature of the neighborhoods in which these events took place, but not who within those neighborhoods uh, experienced the events.
Uh, but still, it's, it's getting closer, right? All right. So what do we, if, if this is uh, an area of work that uh, merits our attention, uh, we can ask, well, what other countries, in addition to those that you saw on, on, on the map, are uh, fielding this kind of disaster recording uh, uh, system? There's a little bit of experimentation in Asia. Um, a couple of states in India, uh, Sri Lanka has uh, uh, participated in the program. Um, but elsewhere, uh, and, all, and likewise in Africa, a few, Mali, for example, but not so far as I know, uh, Mozambique. Um, it would be very interesting to know where are similar efforts underway, if not precisely analogous, but close, at least in, in spirit. I am quite skeptical that this kind of recording mechanism uh, will gather uh, adequate information on slower onset uh, disasters such as droughts and water scarcity. In a sense, those aren't, those slow uh, uh, developing uh, conditions aren't as newsworthy, right, as uh, the sudden onset events, and therefore do not tend to generate the stream of reports that one would get from landslides, floods, and so forth. So somehow, as we think about drought risks, water scarcity risks, a different kind of data collection uh, instrument is going to be needed, I think, to, to get an adequate account of, of, of these things. Um, so let me uh, end there and th thank you. Uh, uh, looking at time, I would say uh, let's collect the question, very brief uh, comments and questions, and then then we will ask, we'll give, uh, we'll give Mark the opportunity to answer and address that. Uh, Adamu, please. Um, thank you. I just wanted to make a, man, um, a brief comment about this inventar. That's the database I use for Argentina. Um, it has a, a certain bias toward urban areas because most of the data or a part of the data is coming from a newspaper or another uh, news, uh, news places. But I think that uh, if depending what area you are considering, uh, in the case of Guatemala, as indicated, it could be very good. In the case of Argentina, the one I was using, it was not as good. But I think that the potential from this inventory is that it could be extended in some kind of crowdsourcing um, system. Uh, and I started to think in a way of providing some of the data that I collected about drought. Specifically, I work in, a dry, in an arid uh, area and droughts are not um, register because they are slow onset, so there is not a clear point in time when you can go to a newspaper and see what happened, but you have declaration of emergencies, and, and that's a way of approaching that. Just wanted to mention that. And it's, I think that the, po the, the thing that you can pinpoint where exactly it happened is, is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. I'm just uh, in my mind trying to map this uh, against the IPCC chart where we have sort of the, the hazard and, and then the exposure and the vulnerability. So uh, your data really is in, in, the, in the intersection of the three. Uh, would this data allow you to, let's say, over time observe whether climate change increases the hazard Probably not, because you are not measuring landslides, for instance, in areas where no people live. It's only if these actually affect people. So you have no objective measure on an increased hazard. Is this right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, having, uh, as you know, lived in Guatemala and uh, worked on the, these issues, uh, I would like to um, uh, suggest, um, and also for Africa, that there are better data sources to monitor and track the vulnerable populations that are exposed to slow onset. And in, in Latin America, we've worked many years on sistemas de vigilancia, surveillance. These are longitudinal 
systems of surveillance. We worked on Vigilancia Alimentaria Nutricional, also surveillance for at food and nutrition security, and also on epidemiological surveillance. For slow, for slow onset, these are the best, really, sources of data. Uh, what's important is that in the research that we do with these systems, with the uh, NIH, uh, the Rand Rockefeller uh, data, the FAO, uh, is that we embed uh, 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 studies on them. What we find, and this of relates to migration, is that often the most vulnerable or exposed, exposed to, let's say, the uh, drought or to price, price shocks, price shocks are really important, are seasonal migrants, seasonal. And in Guatemala, as I told you yesterday, the most vulnerable were those who were migrating from the indigenous uh, highlands to the coffee plantations. We followed that the coffee plantations, not the cotton or the sugar. But you have to really follow, follow these and in, 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 different, in different seasons. So while these types of uh, uh, municipio level data are in a sense, uh, they're important as, uh, under, as an underlay. Uh, it's not the municipios that are so important. Again, it's these livelihood zones, these agroecological zones. That, I really think, should be uh, an essential unit of analysis. And then the fa tracking the vulnerable groups when in the slow onset, by season, uh, and by you know, pre-harvest, post-harvest, or when the price shocks hit. So I would like to, and again, also in Africa, we have the in-depth network as you know, that, uh, that also follows. But we need to do more uh, analysis with that, with that data. And one warning is, it's very hard to manage the data on surveillance systems. Very difficult. But I think that with the younger generation of uh, tech-savvy uh, people, uh, it's a lot easier to manage it now than it used to be. Um, very brief. Um, follow the discussion uh, Wolfgang mentioned. Um, can we use uh, that uh, right now, um, spatially, we um, can measure ex the exposure. Can we have data like uh, to understand uh, over time changes uh, and to look at, uh, at what resolution population changing and uh, who um, the, the, our, and also the composition change, we can measure not only the exposure and also look into the possibility of adaptive capacity. Yes, thank you for those, those questions. The, um, let me start with the, uh, the last pairing of Wolfgang's question and, and Leibniz. Uh, when disinventory was designed, a design decision was made at the outset that this was not going to be a record of meteorological events, that there, those records were being collected, that if a, uh, a flood causes a tree to fall in a forest when there's nobody there, um, that is not the concern of disinventory. It was on the human costs of, of, of um, uh, these events. And so in, in a sense, you can't use uh, recorded events that have harmed humans to tell you about the universe of events, uh, some of which may have uh, taken place in unpopulated uh, areas. On the other hand, if you, you can, I think, usefully compare uh, the record of events that have harmed humans against the probability, according to the physical scientists, that those um, uh, hazards would materialize. So if you see flood losses in areas where the um, physical scientists, the climate scientists, had not predicted a high risk of flooding, that's informative. Right? So it's a bit asymmetric uh, that way in what, what, what can be done. Um, uh, Susanna mentioned uh, the, the potential for uh, urban bias, uh, which I guess you saw in the Argentina case. And again, there, there is a, a social reality about um, uh, the recording of, of events, that events that take place in more densely populated areas with media, with uh, other sources, are, are more likely to be recorded. We know those biases uh, are, are, are exist. And I think that is an important um, extra layer of, of, uh, of warning that has to be uh, brought to bear. 
Um, Charles made the interesting point about what kinds of demographic um, uh, programs and measures would be most helpful for uh, monitoring slower onset conditions. And I think you're correct that, well, firstly, there's no substitute for longitudinal individual level data, and that's what surveillance systems are, right? Uh, so that, uh, but those systems have not been deployed um, uniformly. Uh, even in Africa, they are rural, or maybe rural urban interface systems. So you see a picture of a piece of a country that may not represent the broader experience. And, but I think to go back, um, and forth between that detail, spatially specific detail for certain places and the cruder broad brush uh, characterizations that the kind of data I, I presented uh, provide, uh, that's helpful, right? It's helpful to know whether your surveillance system is in an unusual area according to these uh, other measures or whether it might be roughly representative of, uh, of experience. So I conclude this uh, session and thank you all presenters and for all for participants for questions. Thank you.